So, welcome. And we, we move tonight to the very heart of Mark's gospel, in my view. Uh, scholars have sometimes called Mark's gospel a passion narrative with an extended introduction. Do you know what a passion narrative is? The story of the things that lead up to the cross and the cross, and then, of course, the culmination in the resurrection. Um, a passion narrative with a long introduction because the cross is seen as so central to Mark's gospel. We, we start that centrality in chapter 8, right after 22, and we've been there twice already. Right? So the cross becomes central starting in 8, but the second thing that becomes central is a more focused, a, a more focused presentation of what discipleship is. And this is what I talked to you about last week, that Jesus in the latter, from 822 through 10 especially, goes deeply into the question, what is it to be a disciple of Jesus? How many aren't interested in that? Right? Raise your hand if you're not interested in what Jesus thinks a disciple looks like. Um, it's something we all care about because that's what we're here for, kind of, right? Uh, for the most part, we're here because we're people who want to follow Jesus. And if he gives lessons on that, we would show up. If Jesus had a webinar on how to follow him, how many of you would show up? I, I, would, I would buy that, um, right? So this is his webinar, 822 through the end of chapter 10 is where he lays focus on what it is to be a disciple. Now, one of the, uh, one of the benefits and risks of doing Bible study the way we've been doing it, reading Mark the way we've been, been reading it, is that we've tracked these passages a couple times now for other reasons. Last week, we looked at the disciples' failings, and so in order to get at those, the daft disciples, we, we went to the action predictions of Jesus and how they just were oblivious and didn't get it quite. So we've already touched a bit there, right? And and so I don't want it to feel redundant to you. Of course, we can't hear it too many times. Uh, it happens to be one of the hardest things to learn. That's why the disciples were oblivious. But I want to start in the middle of this section in a passage that preachers among you, and I know there are several, have probably not flocked to to preach. And devotional writers usually don't flock to to write about because it's just darn hard to understand. Let's go to the middle and go to the salt. End of chapter 9. End of chapter 9. And we'll learn a lot from this in one little stretch, right? In, in this one little short paragraph. And it's 49 and 50, just two verses. So we're coming off the, the transfiguration and the uh, the healing of a boy with a, a demon, and we're coming off the first passion prediction in 33, uh, 30 and following, and a bit about this shape of discipleship that we'll get back to in 33 and following. Uh, we're, we're getting right after Jesus's talk about stumbling stones, not being one and not keeping things that cause you to stumble. All right, so that's the context. We've led up with a quick run in nine of, a, of not a grab bag, it's pretty intentional, I think, but, but a, a run of things that happen quickly and don't, aren't all obviously related. We get to 49, and I'm going to read it out to you. And you in chat, if you know how to work chat, in your chat, put the number between 1 and 10 that ranks how well you understand this just by hearing it, right? So the level of lucidity, how much it's clear to you just by hearing it. Jesus said, for everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. How many, how many eight to 10? I get this through and through. I understand this salty stuff like the back of my hand, right? How many five to seven? I kind of get this. I get part of it. I, you know, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many feel like they're one to four somewhere? Okay, yeah. Salt, 
we have this vague recollection of Jesus talking about salt, but it's likely from Matthew 5.13, where Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, you are the salt of the earth. But if that salt has lost its savor, it ain't got much in its favor, as Godspell puts it, right? Um, and so, so we hear it from that one, and that's where we get our category of salt. We, we, Lot's wife becomes a pillar of salt. We've got some salt passages in our background if we went to Sunday school or, or hang around Jesus people very much. But these ones may sound foreign to you, and the reason is what I said a couple minutes ago. Preachers stay away from them, mostly, and devotionals and Sunday schools stay away from them. They go over to the easier to understand Matthew 5 passage, right? So you and I, because we are AP Bible readers, because we're after this, are going to dig in and see what we can get out of these slightly confusing back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back verses of, on salt. All right? Let's pray for some help as we start, and then we'll move from here up to before and after and grab everything we can tonight that Jesus gives us about discipleship in these chapters. So let's pray together, and then we'll move forward. Our God, uh, we thank you. We thank you for salt. We thank you for your call to us. We thank you for this section of this book that gives us insights, and some of them a little uh, scrapey and hard to take, insights into exactly what you're calling us to when you come up to our boats and our nets and say, follow me. So in this latter day, in this uh, 21st century, we pray for your guidance on what discipleship looks like through the eyes of Jesus. We pray in Jesus. Amen. All right, a couple, uh, couple of things just as we, as we go forward, just uh, schedule things. One is that next week, in our order of things, we'll go to chapters 11 through 13, okay? 11 through 13, which means we start with Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and we go through his apocalyptic words to his disciples, right? That's going to be uh, the early part of the, of the last week of Jesus' earthly life, right? In Jerusalem, all of it. Our last passage today will take us to Jericho, just on the front porch of, Jer of going into Jerusalem. So in Jerusalem the whole time, first half of the week, right? That's, that's next. And then, of course, we'll, we'll make our way to 14 and 15, and then we'll finish with 16 in our last session. Okay? Everybody with on that? The second thing is to reiterate that if your questions don't get answered in class, some of you have been writing me notes and I appreciate it. I've tried to get to everyone that I've seen. Um, but if, if your questions don't get answered in, in class and, and we don't get to them through your chatting them, please, please don't hesitate to email me at alan at houseunitedmovement.org. There's another thing, I was talking to a few of you before all of you came. There's another thing that you might want that email address for. I am producing, uh, a 21 day, it's not a 21 day challenge, it's a 21 day attempt to help um, as we go toward the election. So it started last Thursday, but if you want to get these, they come out every morning, they're daily devotionals uh, that it's basically being faithful in an election season, right? So sign on if you'd like, just by sending an email and I'll put you on the list of people who get them. I think we're at 630 people getting them now. Um, because a lot of people are seeing that they would like some help at it. Um, all right, so those are the logistical things I have. Anything, raise your hand if you've got something that you need to know about how the class goes going forward. All right, let's go back to Saul. As I say, Matthew 5, 13 makes it into God's spell, makes it into our, our understanding of Jesus much more often than this. It's a little more clear and obvious what it might mean. But I wanna read these words again and then track back and see what might be happening. For everyone, says Jesus, will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. All right. One thing
thing to notice right off is that here are three different sayings about salt clustered together. Now, most of our time with the Gospel of Mark so, so far has moved on the assumption that Mark's decisions about where to put things. Remember, Papias said Mark got his stuff from Peter, but then moved it around, which we took to be moved it around for reasons, right? That he didn't leave it all in the same order that kind of like cataloging Peter, he, he arrayed it intentionally. And so we've seen how he builds a narrative that has subtleties and in which there's a beginning and middle and end and has a purpose going forward, right? And we've been rewarded for that reading. Last time it was the disciples see Jesus uh, feed 5,000 people and then uh, five, you know, five minutes later in the living room where they're hearing the gospel, the, the people who are hearing Mark's gospel for the first time hear the disciples not able to understand that Jesus can do this when he only has 4,000 people to feed, right? And whereas past readers have sometimes said, well, isn't Mark clumsy? He didn't realize he had done that earlier on. You and I actually came to appreciate that he might have been doing that intentionally to par portray the disciples as just not the kind of guys who got it real quick, right? And that fits with what comes after it because then they start not getting the passion predictions, which we'll see this time, right? So that's one, and way back in one to three, we noticed the crowds growing and we thought maybe these responses by Jewish authorities aren't about legal purity and, and uh, sort of enforcing Mosaic law. Maybe they're about turf battles because it's just as Jesus gets popular that they get a little more enforcing, right? And so, so we've seen our way of reading rewarded. Tonight with the salt passage, I want to introduce a way that early Christian writers, gospel writers and others, would have gathered their material and presented their material. And sometimes that was simply around, wait, these three are about salt, right? So it was topical. In Luke chapter 16, we get that very strange parable of the unjust steward, which is followed by the sort of four or five different sections on money, sayings on money. And so it seems like Luke's habit in that, or at least his inclination in that section, is to say, Jesus said several things on the theme of money, and they all go together here. And I, I'm going to cluster them because they're all on the same theme. So gospel writers sometimes do that as a part of their way of building narrative. It seems like that's what Mark has done with salt, right? I could name five or six other examples, but we don't need that. Um, it seems like he has seen three salt passages from all the stuff on his work table and said, I'm going to put these together. But that doesn't mean he didn't have a method to the madness. So I want us now to, to think about what does each of those three sayings mean and how might they fit within this flow of what discipleship is? All right, so back to the first of them. For everyone will be salted with fire. Anybody want to explain that to us all? What does Jesus mean when he says everyone will be salted with fire? Just to tell you that it's not the easiest thing in the world to get, there are three or four what, what are called textual variants, which means somebody who copied it later and handed it on to the next church to read it Somebody who copied it later tried to move the words around a little, thinking there must be a mistake. Salted with fire doesn't make sense. And they try to try to fix it a little bit, right? That, that is usually a pretty good sign that something is hard to understand in its original, right? And so, so don't feel bad about this not being uh, just completely clear. There are some Old Testament possibilities, some Hebrew scripture possibilities for understanding where this, um, where this might originate. And the first one I want you to, to look at with me is Leviticus 2.13. So we're New Testament people, but we're also Hebrew scripture people, uh, Old Testament people, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. And as we turn there, um, 
there's a there's a sort of opportunity to remind ourselves that the the what we call the Old Testament is the only Bible Jesus and the disciples had. It's the only Bible Paul had. It's the only Bible Peter had. It's the only Bible anybody writing in the New Testament had. So so it's it's important for us to remember. Uh, I, I wrote a devotional last week on on Esau hugging Jacob rather than killing him in, in Genesis 33. You know the passage. They've been away from one another for 20, 20 years after Jacob has stolen birthright and blessing from, from his older brother Esau, right? When we, last we saw them, it was murderous rage. When by the time Jacob comes home and gets his kind of gumption up to return to the land of Canaan, he, he expects that Esau is still going to be boiling mad. Instead, Esau runs up to him and embraces him, right? And Jacob says, in your face, I see the face of God, right? It's a great, great passage. I think that it's echoed in the prodigal son, right? I think it's echoed in the prodigal son. And who knows whether Jesus wasn't thinking about Esau in Genesis 33 when he sort of crafted the prodigal son story. So this, we got to remember it. That was Jesus' Bible. He loved Isaiah. He loved Psalms. And I think he loved Esau getting back together with Jacob. So we're in Leviticus now. And the part of Leviticus we're going to take a quick look at is uh, 2.13. Sorry, my pages are sticking together. There it is. I'm going to start at 11. No grain offering that you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven. For you must not turn any leaven or honey into smoke as an offering by fire to the Lord. You may bring them to the Lord as an offering of choice products, but they shall not be offered on the altar for a pleasing odor. You shall not omit from your grain offerings the salt of the covenant with your God. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. Right? Now, Leviticus is just a hoot to read, as you know. Um, it's the, the fastidious way of understanding every little detail about sacrifice does get a little old. Uh, anybody, of you, any of you who know the name Rob Bell, Rob Bell uh, showed his distinction from other people who do this kind of work by the first sermon series he preached when he went to Mars Hill, where it was, it was small and it became big during his time there. The first sermon series he preached was on Leviticus because he said, if people will come for Leviticus, they will come for any part of the Bible, right? And, and so, not a not exactly a bestseller um, Leviticus 2 but 13 beams us in on the fact that salt was used in the sacrifice in fact you were always supposed to use it in this particular sacrifice right and so it may be that Jesus is drawing on that and and putting together the notion of burning as a sacrifice would be burning would be burned with salt right Salt and, and sacrifice go together, and fire is a part of all that, so that may be where it comes from. On the other hand, it may be the fire is the fire of judgment. In Malachi 2 and 3, anybody remember, uh, it's put to music beautifully, anybody remember, um, he shall beat you like a refining fire, right? And so Malachi pictures judgment and the preparation for judgment in terms of fire and it has a relationship there to sacrifice so so we don't know exactly where jesus want, got it but there's plenty to plumb into in the hebrew scripture that may have leaned jesus toward talking this way about or at least to his disciples if it's about judgment right if it's about preparation for judgment getting ready for the refiners uh fire and and the judgment to follow or if it has to do with the afterlife which most commentators lean toward right then we would come away you've saw you've seen if you read up for this uh for this session you've seen that jesus leans toward judgment two or three times we get the rich young ruler who asks what do i do to uh gain eternal life and so there, there's salvation in play in the verse verses maybe 15 beyond this there also has been uh, in Jesus' uh, chapter 8 where he says, if you are ashamed of the Son of Man in these days, uh, the Son of Man will be ashamed of you in the, in the last days, right? So, so we've got 
judgment around and afterlife around. So, so let's just tilt this one toward salt and fire kind of move in Jesus's understanding to this gets you ready for judgment, for, for God's sort of demanding or at least exacting judgment before the afterlife, right? The second one, nobody's going to be satisfied by this, by the way. There's a reason theologians and exegetes still battle over these. They aren't absolutely, oh, that's obvious, right? But second one, and then, and then we'll um, do the third and then put them all together. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Now, this one may be the one that you most quickly cotton to because it sounds a lot like 513 of Matthew. Right? It sounds like what he's saying is, you know what? Your job as a disciple in the world is to be salt to it, right? That's the way most people interpret 513 of Matthew. And it's the way most people interpret this middle salt saying in, Ma in Mark 9, right? So if the first one is toward the afterlife, I'm going to say this, get ready, do the things that you need before the afterlife, salt and fire, right? And the second one is be salty in the world. Be a, a, a preservative, a seasoning in the world. The third then goes, have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Now, there were certain ancient rituals involving salt that had to do with covenants in which people could either be reconciled or agree on something. That may be the location of this, in which case, the first one is about the afterlife. The second one is about living in the world, and the third one may be about living in the church, right? Peace among yourselves as followers of Jesus, which would be a pretty expansive reach for three small salt passages, the here and now in the world, the here and now in the church, and the afterlife. Is that about cover it, right? <laughs> so, so it may be that Jesus has has put these three compactly together, or Mark has drawn them together to say something about how Jesus thought of discipleship. Namely, it matters here inside church, inside the group of disciples. It matters here in the world, right? And it matters here toward the next world. Wouldn't that be nifty? I do that as sort of a microcosm because Jesus is going to touch on each of those three elements in the course of these passages in 8 to 10. Please put questions in the chat. I want to remind you because this is a very, very curious passage, but that's my read. First, judgment. Second, uh, in the world. And third, in the church. Salt here, salt there, salt everywhere. All right. Now let's go back to where we begin this section in 822. And we are going to read there because we've read it too many times, right? We've read it two weeks in a row before this. But I do want to pick up at 8... Um, 831. Uh, excuse me, 34. We've read through 33. 833 is where Jesus calls Peter Satan. Remember that scene? Because... He, Satan, uh, Peter opposes Jesus's walk to the cross, and Jesus portrays him as a tempter in that. We went through that a couple weeks ago, right? Then in 34, he called the crowd with his disciples, and he said to them, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their, their life? Other translations have soul. Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Soul. Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And I'm going to stop there, even though it could run into 9-1. We'll talk about 9-1 in a second. All right, so what is the shape of discipleship here? Jesus has just announced his cross. 
just announced where he's going. He's already had resistance from one of his primary disciples, one of the guys who keeps getting in these groups of three, Peter, James, John, and the Transfiguration, Peter, James, John, Andrew as the first disciples, right? So, so he's just had to correct one of his A students in a way, although they, we saw last week they're all C or beneath. Um, now, he turns around to the whole crowd and says, I wasn't kidding. Do you know what discipleship looks like? It looks like giving up your life. In Bonhoeffer's words, Christ bids us to come and die, right? And, and so the, the picture, and really the first picture he's made, he's drawn, of what discipleship looks like is of self-sacrifice, of, of giving up love, life, of dying. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, right? Here, Jesus's picture is of coming and taking up a cross. And nobody would have interpreted that as anything except taking up death. And they wouldn't have known what kind of death he means, right? He probably doesn't mean get on the wrong side of the Roman law. But he does mean carry death with you in some way, right? Because, he says, if you try to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose it for my sake, you'll find it. Now, we can do all kinds of psychological and spiritual, uh, psycholo psychologizing and spiritualization of that. But that seems to be the point that the disciples most often miss. We saw last week that Jesus said, I'm going to go and die, and Peter bucked it. And then in chapter 9, Jesus said, I'm going to go and die, and they're all, they're all talking about who will be greatest, right? And then in chapter 10, Jesus says, I'm going to go and die. And James and John say, that's interesting. Can we sit on your right and left, right? Three times they have a shot at getting the most important thing he's trying to tell them. And three times they completely let it fly by. Last week, we treated them as, as daft. But denial ain't just a river in Egypt, right? These folks may be unable to process it it says it's in nine they didn't understand it they couldn't understand it right they may be un unable to process it because it's just too terrible a thought for them not just that jesus will die but that a chapter ago he linked that to some kind of dying for them right how many of you when you hear you know an infomercial that says okay come and give up your life are suddenly sending money Right? This is not something that draws great crowds. In fact, those, those flocks who came to Jesus in the early part of the book, right, the, the sort of growth of his, his popularity wasn't because he was saying this. His popularity grew because he was blessedly and validly and generously and lovingly helping people and teaching people, and that grows a crowd. But once you start talking about the cross, it, it shrinks a little bit, right? So, so it is natural for us, just as the disciples, to avoid this. Can you write in chat if you have an idea of ways that we avoid this? This is pretty direct language, right? But ask anybody what it is to be a disciple in your next church group or in your next uh, sort of small group or, or in your next setting where there are Christians gathered. And the first thing you hear will unlikely be, well, being a disciple is dying to self. Right? It'll probably have to do with imitation of Jesus. It'll probably have to do with things that live, right? This image has eluded most generations of Christians. John Michael Talbot, few be the lovers in this painting, few be the lovers of the cross, right? So, so it's worth taking seriously our own aversion to this 20, 20 centuries later, right? Our own aversion, our own tendency to run toward other things. So Jesus sets the tone for his whole picture of discipleship with the, with the image of death. 
and following him to the cross beyond just the physical geographical move, following him by taking up our own cross. If we had more time and we were in the same room and, and we could do small groups, we'd break out and ask, what does that mean to, in life, right? What are examples of places where you have experienced taking up a cross or where you've seen somebody taking up a cross? And that's a good thing for you to think about and, and ruminate on now and Holy Week and any other time you get a shot at it. But it's, it's, tonight it's gonna have to suffice just to point out the centrality of the cross in Jesus' sense of what it is to follow him, right? But let's go on because there are other things. It, it, it doesn't simply start there, stop there. He continues teaching his disciples through these, these two and a half chapters. So what we just read gives way to a saying, and he said to them, truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they uh, see that the kingdom of God has come with power, right? What happens very next? The transfiguration. We talked about it uh, a couple weeks ago, and the transfiguration happens where Peter and James and John go up with Jesus up onto the mount, which is more like a hill, right? And the, the discipleship item here seems to be what happens in verse 7. Right? Jesus has just spoken that his future is to go into Jerusalem and be killed by the authorities there. Peter has suggested that's not exactly the right future, right? That, that Jesus may be wrong about what he's supposed to do because messiahs don't die. It's not more than five minutes later in the reading that Je Jesus goes up on a hill and the voice of God comes out of the cloud and says, by the way, Peter, this is my beloved son. Listen to him, right? In other words, this sort of, oh, Jesus must be wrong, doesn't square with the voice of the Almighty. So a second principle, if, it's, if dying is the starting point for discipleship in Mark, the second principle is, whatever else you do, listen to this guy, Jesus, right? Not just about the cross, but about everything going forward. It's an often authenticating statement from, from the heavens, and it applies directly to discipleship because people who follow Jesus listen to him, right? That's, a, that's as obvious as it gets, but it, it doesn't go without saying. So the next passage. The next passage is the coming of Elijah, which leads. So um, Jesus essentially says that Elijah has already come, and he likens Elijah to John. We heard a couple chapters ago that John has been killed by Herod. Here, he parallels John with Elijah and says, in that expectation, Elijah has already come, and they did what they, what they wanted with him, pointing to Herod's killing. The next passage is one I want us to dig deep, deeper in. It's the healing of a boy with a spirit. When they came to the disciples, the crowd, the people around, they saw a great crowd around them and some scribes arguing with the disciples. And when the whole crowd saw him, Jesus, they were immediately overcome with awe and they ran forward to greet him. He asked them, what are you arguing about with them? Someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought you my son. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. And whenever it seizes him, it dashes him down and foams and grinds at his teeth and becomes rigid. And I asked your disciples to cast it out, but they couldn't do so. He answered them, you faithless generation, how much longer must I be among you? How much longer must I put up with you? Bring him with me, bring him to me. And they brought the boy. When the spirit saw him, immediate, saw Jesus, immediately it convulsed in the boy and he fell on the ground and rolled about foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, well, from childhood. It's often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you're able to do anything, have pity on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you are able, you're saying, if you are able, all things can be done for the one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you spirit that keeps this boy from speaking and hearing, 
I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And crying after the, out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse. So most of them said he's dead, but Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he was able to stand. Right? I want to stop there and we'll get back to 28. All right. I don't know what you're hearing in this story, but if we're looking at it for details on how to be a disciple, I want you to ask and answer in the chat if you've got, uh, if you've got a thought. What does this tell us about discipleship? And I, I want to ask that realizing together and as an interpretive clue about how to read Mark, I want to ask that with the realization that the disciples may not be the only ones we look at to find out what discipleship looks like. In other words, the story of Mark, Mark's Jesus, can teach us about being a disciple from people who make these little cameo appearances, right? Faith pops out in places. Here we've got a faithless group, and, and Jesus chides them. But then we've got this father. You notice what the father says. It's famous. There are a lot of people who preach on this passage, right? You notice what the father said. Unlike this generation that Jesus has condemned, which is not faithful, they, it, you know, there's a, there's a sort of resistance of, of not believing. Unlike that, Jesus seizes on this man and says, do you believe? And he says, I believe, help my unbelief, right? Famous, famous passage, not spoken by a disciple. Can you imagine Peter saying, help my unbelief? Not Peter as he's presented in Mark, right? He seems to be pretty sure of himself. This guy may show us something none of the disciples do, which is a sort of humility about our need for help, right? And so we don't want to just track the disciples if we're, if we're in Jesus' webinar on discipleship. We want to also see it in the cameos, because if we get that here, from the man who says, I believe, uh, but I need help believing, right? I believe help my unbelief. We also get it down the line in a passage we're not going to get to spend much time in, but we did see last time. And that is blind Bartimaeus, right? Blind Bartimaeus comes as the counterpoint to James and John. In chapter, in chapter 10, James and John ask for glorious places, the good seats next to Jesus in the kingdom. And he, they do it in response to Jesus' question, what do you want me to do for you, right? Forward one episode, Jesus goes into Jericho, and there's blind Bartimaeus just shouting and trying to get his attention. The disciples resist. Uh, Jesus says, bring him in. And Jesus asks him, strangely, the very same question with the very same words, what do you want me to do for you? And he says the very simple thing that has more than one level. He says, I want to see. And so Jesus gives him physical sight. But the very next thing he does is fall in line. And it says, follow Jesus on the way. Right? So as you're compiling your sense of what it is to be a, a disciple in the Gospel of Mark, these cameos become really important. We saw last week that in some ways the disciples let us down, at least in their performance of faith, right? The guy who says, I believe, help my belief, unbelief, uh, embodies humility in a disciple. And the guy who says, I want to see, and then follows Jesus on the way, embodies this sort of uh, sense of need, right? So, Humility is in both of them. That might be something we want to put on our disciples are this list. In that light, Jonathan Sachs, uh, my favorite sort of superhero rabbi from London, Sir Jonathan Sachs, has said that humility is the orphaned virtue of our age. So if you live out a humble discipleship, you're going you're gonna to be an outlier in an age of everybody knows their politics is right. Everybody knows they are right. Sort of the, 
the arrogance of social media, right, presentations of self. This is one that kicks against our culture right now, folks. Sign on for Jesus the humility and you'll be a unique character in your neighborhood, right? The guy who says, I believe, help my unbelief, helps us with that. So does blind Bartimaeus. All right, let's go on beyond the, the healing of the boy. Um, Jesus again foretells his death and resurrection, and then uh, the disciples don't get it. They didn't understand. They asked, um, Jesus tells them that the greatest will be the least, the greatest will be the servant of all. Right? Then in 38 and following, we get another lesson on discipleship. Because in 38 and following, the disciples shout down a guy who's casting out demons in Jesus' name. They say, you can't do that. And they come in and they write him a ticket for, for anti-Jesus behavior, right? And, and Or for, for unlawful uh, Jesusing, right? And, and so, so that they come back and they, they report to Jesus. <laughs> we, we caught the guy. And you remember what Jesus says, if they're not against us, they're for us. Right? In Mark, if they're not against us, they're for us, is a, a discipleship principle. Right? It widens the circle of the blessed. Right? That's another important thing in our time. There are plenty of people who are against one another in our time, but the, the little, I mean, we have 33,000 denominations in the Protestant uh, side of Christianity, right? 33,000, which means we have a lot of times said those people are casting out demons in your name and, and we don't think they ought to do it, right? A lot of times have differentiated ourselves. Here, Jesus is widening the fold and saying, if they're doing our stuff, they're us. Right? That's another possibility of community building among the people of God. Right? Discipleship may be partly about having the humility to say, well, Ours isn't necessarily the only game in town. Right? Our, not Christianity, but our variety of Christianity maybe is not the only game in town. All right, we're, we're speed shooting, as you, as you can see, because I want to get to uh, chapter 10. I want to spend just a little bit of time with the run through 42, 42 to 48, where Jesus does two things. Jesus says, anybody who causes one of these little ones to stumble, right, is in huge trouble. That is my responsibility for you, right? I am made as a disciple responsible not just for myself, but for your not stumbling. Reminds me of 1 Corinthians 8, where Paul says uh, the, the weaker members in Corinth are saying, wait a second, we don't think you should be able to eat meat sacrificed to idols, Right? And Paul says, uh, in order not to cause them to stumble, you should not eat meat sacrificed to idols, even though it doesn't uh, cause you to stumble, right? The responsibility of one for the other is a discipleship principle. Jesus paints it here by saying, first, you better not cause another one to stumble because that's big trouble for you. Second, then, he says, by the way, if anything in you is causing you to stumble, let's get rid of it, right? It's then this is the cut your hand off if it's causing you to stumble, put your eye out, right? If your leg is causing you to stumble, take it off. Jesus makes us responsible for both the other's faith and our own, right? Both deferring to and helping not get in the way of other people who are following and taking responsibility for our own walk. David Bartlett, a blessed memory at Yale Divinity School, one of my favorite people in the world, passed away, I think, three or four years ago now, um, uh, tragically. But we got, to teach, uh, we got to teach Mark together. And we had to teach Matthew together. And when we were doing Matthew, he took the parable of the, of the maidens who are left out without their oil. Remember, they go out to buy oil, and, and they don't get back in time. And a lot of us struggle with that. Wait a second, couldn't they just open the door? Um, and when he was teaching this, David Bartlett came up with a principle I think applies here, which is, I can pray for you, but I can't pray instead of you. Let me say that again. I can pray for you, 
but I can't pray instead of you. The second part of this little bit on stumbling stones seems to be about that. I am responsible for getting rid of stumbling stones in my own life, right? And others are responsible for not putting them there. You are responsible for getting rid of stumbling stones in your own life, and I'm responsible not to throw some in your way. You see? So it's both a corporate responsibility and everyone carries his own way, to, to quote Paul from 1 Thessalonians, right? That makes sense? All right. We're going speed fast, but there's a lot of stuff here about discipleship. So I'm sorry if, it, if it's sort of leaving anyone in the dust. I don't think it's high concept, but we are moving a lot of words per minute. Um, the, um, in, in the first part of 10, we get to teaching on divorce. I just want to touch this, right? Just want to touch it. Because in it, Jesus ends up saying something that puts him in the context of an ancient rabbinic conversation. Namely, under what conditions can, in that Jewish setting, can a man divorce his wife? Right? And Hillel, the great rabbi Hillel, said if she burns your toast, you can divorce her, basically. A man can divorce a woman for any reason. Shammai, his counterpart, says only in the case of adultery, right? They argue back and forth about this. Notice what, what Mark's Jesus says. In Mark's uh, teaching on divorce, uh, verse 10 through 12, in the, in the house with his disciples, they asked him about this. He said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Notice how Jesus goes even farther. He doesn't have any conditions under which it's okay. Now, some have said, some Bible scholars have said, this must be Mark doing what Mark does rather than Jesus doing what Jesus does. Because first, women couldn't divorce people in, in Jewish uh, circles, right? It wasn't allowed. So why does he cover the women's side? And second, no Jewish teacher was saying there's not any condition under which this can happen, right? I want to get in alongside that and say, just a few chapters ago, why did John the Baptist die? Well, he was criticizing Herod's love life with Herodias, right? What had Herodias done? Herodias had divorced her husband in order to be with Herod. So in the book, three chapters earlier, four chapters earlier, is an example of a woman divorcing a man. So you don't need to go quite to, Jesus never would have said this, because it's even in the near uh, space, right? The second thing is that in Qumran, the Essene community of the Dead Sea Scrolls, there is teaching on, uh, God, I'm trying to remember on which passages in which divorce is categorically disallowed. So if Hillel and Shammai are arguing back and forth over conditions, the, the Essenes, the, the Qumran people, wouldn't brook either of those conditions, right? So that's just to sort of give you, it's not so much on discipleship, although uh, faithful monogamy is, a, is a, an important part of, of uh, discipleship to law, right? Um, it, it's not so much to beam with discipleship, but again, to take a moment just to say, how do we read this book? Well, we read it with a mind for the kinds of questions that what I just talked about allows, which is, where does this fit within its world? And, and is this understandable within the world that both Mark and Jesus occupy, right? Okay, last thing we're gonna do, I promise, we're just running a little over on my time. I hope, to, I hope you'll stay on for Q and A. Um, Last thing is just to go to that famous passage that is kind of the, the epitome for Jesus. It comes back to what we saw in the middle of chapter 8. And it is in, in chapter 10, after Jesus tells that he's going to die, after James and John make their request, after the disciples get angry at them for making their request, Jesus called them in 42 of chapter 10 and said to them, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers, lord it over them, and their great ones 
are tyrants over them, but it is not so among you. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So we close with the same self-giving, self-sacrificial attitude that the cross brought in, in chapter 8. This time Jesus saying himself, the Son of Man came not to be served by people, but to serve them. And that culminates in the giving of his whole life. I want to uh, stay there long enough to recognize the contrast that Jesus draws with the Gentile pattern, right? Uh, not so much confined to first century Gentiles in my experience. In your experience of our world, does the inclination to take the the best seats and the upper hand and the space of domination rather than subjugation or, or um, being the one who gets rather than the one who gives. Does that seem kind of still a little bit of a human tendency? Of course, right? I want to notice how Jesus gives it to the disciples because it seems like what I just described is the competitive instinct. I want to be on top. I want to win. I want to be the person who's in charge instead of the person who's serving. So how does Jesus put his question to the disciples or his, his picture of this? Let's go back to the language. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. What is his starting point? Competitive instinct, right? So what does he do? He moves the goalpost. He doesn't say, what we need to do is to have a competitionectomy in you, right? What we need to do is get rid of that part of you that wants to win. I think Jesus knew the part of us that wants to win is part of standard operating equipment. Paul, several times in his, in his letters, says, basically, I outran all of them because he was driven by competition and in moments it leaked out. Jesus uses competition and then says, you know what you want to win at is being under as many people as you can. In fact, the winner of all will be the slave of all. I think in, in this closing, I think that, that Jesus understood us. He understood that a competition ectomy is not an option. We're built with us in it, with, with, a, with it in us. The project of the disciple becomes retraining ourselves to a different way of understanding what winning looks like and what we're winning at. We redirect the passion towards serving from toward being served, right? That's a lot in 50 minutes, right? And I'm sorry about the mowing here, the kind of fast through, but we got to salt, we got to divorce, we got to, we got to 50 things. Uh, if anything sticks, I'll be happy. For now, let's close in prayer and then we'll do uh, chat questions. So let's, let's pray. Our God, we thank you uh, for this time, for, for this set of passages, for the density of them. I thank you for these folks and their faithful listening and the occasional laugh they give me when I'm trying to be funny. I thank you for the fellowship you build among us and the care you have for us, and the understanding you have of who we are from the start. Thank you for coaching us, teaching us, leading us along as your disciples. We pray in Jesus. Amen. Thank you all. Uh, Kelly, chat questions. This is actually a question that came via email, and I'll just say if anybody else has any other questions, please put them in the chat now. But this is, why is the massacre of the innocents mentioned only in Matthew and not in Mark, which would be expected if Mark was the earliest of the Gospels written and Matthew and Luke were based on Mark as a primary source? Not even Josephus mentions this event. Right, right. So... 
uh, the order of the Gospels is something we've only barely touched. I mentioned that the Gospels, uh, most, the, the majority of scholars of Gospels, think that Ma Mark wrote first, not just because it's the smallest of the three, but because of the kinds of changes that are made um, and what's more likely that, that one would lengthen the story or shorten it and things like that. We won't be able to go long on it. But what's usually thought is that Mark came first and that Matthew used Mark and that uh, these are the options. Luke used Matthew or Matthew and Luke used the same thing, which is called Q, the, the Q source because German for source is Quella, right? In other words, if they had a second thing along with Mark that was a sayings gospel of Q, right? What this, asks, what this question person is asking is, so why does this massacre of the innocents in Matthew 2 only show up there? Why wouldn't Mark tell it? It's just an outlandish event, and he doesn't seem to want to flatter Herod. Uh, so why, why, would he, why would he pull that punch? And, and we don't know. We don't know if Mark had that tradition. See, that's, that's one of the things we always have to wonder. Who, what does he have on his, on his work table? We don't know. We know everything that he put in was something that he had on his work table, but we don't know what else he had that he declined or didn't, didn't see fitting into the gospel as he was telling it uh, to, to communicate to his people. So the, the easy answer is, we don't know. And then we start asking, well, how does it fit into Matthew? And of course, we don't have time for that tonight. So an unsatisfying answer to the person over email, but that's all, I, uh, there's hardly any other way to answer that, I think. Kelly, is there, are there any others? There are. Um, all right, the next, and I'm going to ask. I'll take, a couple quick, I'll take a couple quick fire. If you can stay on for another couple minutes, I'll do two more, and then anybody who wants to stay and chat after, we can okay. continue. Uh, and I'll ask Adrian to clarify this uh, if we need it. But was the problem not who prayed, but the level of faith of the one praying in this particular case? Yeah, so, um, so this one comes out only by prayer is the answer to um, why, why were we unable to cast out this, this demon Jesus? Remember in that scene with the little boy whom Jesus finally healed and, and or cast the demon out of and uh, I believe helped my unbelief, right? Well, in the very next scene, the disciples say, why couldn't we do it? And Jesus says, this one comes out only by praise, right? And I think the person is asking, does it matter who prays or how they pray? Is that the question, Kelly? Yeah, was the problem not who prayed, but the level of faith of the one praying? Yeah, yeah. So we're coming off, uh, I believe, help my unbelief. And the next thing is this. So it would be um, not just this kind comes out only by prayer, but probably this comes out only by believing prayer, right? Some have asked added fasting in manuscripts that come later, but it seems like it was only prayer in what Jesus would have said or what Mark would have reported at least. All right, next question, Kelly, and then I will let, every, thank you for staying on a little longer. I'll let everybody out who has to go and then anybody who wants to stay can. All right, this one comes from Linda. So Linda, feel free to chime in on context around this, but she writes cross versus yoke. It was. It occurred to it occurred to me, Ellen, as we were speaking, that there um, we're talking about the cost of the cross, and yet in other places we talk about Jesus' yoke. And in my mind, I used to think that possibly those two were were closely related because Jesus then says, "The yoke, my yoke is easy," yeah. and yet we just looked at the cross, and that ain't easy. So ain't I'm just easy. wondering if if there's a connection there. Yeah, and so come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. It's Matthew. Uh, take my yoke upon me, uh, upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you will find rest unto your soul, right? Um, so my yoke is easy, and my burden is light comes right after that. And what, what I hear Linda asking is, is, is that supposed to be equated with cross or related to cross, or are they two different parts of being a disciple, right? And since it comes in a rest, and relief passage i've always taken yoke to be a, a very separate part of what jesus does with disciples from the call to uh, an instrument of death 
right? Yoke know, is it has a different kind of way of being constructive in a in a disciple's life. It seems like it's a it's a vehicle of you're going to be you're going to be connected to me and bound to me in a way, right? But there are times when relief is the form of that, or rest is the form of that. Um, okay. But I like the parallel you're drawing because you got two wooden things that people yeah, carry, right? Shoulders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and say a good night to anybody who needs to get on into that good night. Um, thank you, thank you, especially to those in the East for staying a, a little longer. They are the ones who get most tired, I think, because they're in the latest time zone. Um, next, next week, same bat time, same bat channel, we go into Jerusalem. We get to Holy Week and do its first couple days. So join me and we will walk with Jesus through Jerusalem. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your reading. And I'll see you next time to anyone who would need to leave. Um, anyone who wants to stay, open your mic and ask questions or make comments or uh, reflect anything that you'd like to do, just as we usually do. I'd like to ask a question. Yes. Um, when, we, when we started, Mark, the unclean spirits had called um, Jesus the Son of God. Blind yes. Bartimaeus says, um, well, Son I saw of your David. On the Is that of any significance? Yeah, yeah. So, so all blind Bartimaeus knows is that Jesus has been called Son of David. And no human in the narrative for Mark is going to get to call Jesus Son of God until that cross. You and I actually talked about that three or four weeks ago, right, in, in this setting. In a different um, setting, right. Yeah, I mean, not in this text setting, but in this class setting. And and so every claim about Jesus falls short of that by any human, even when even when Peter gets you're the Messiah, he gets it wrongly, right? Um, so Bartimaeus, good old Bartimaeus, knows that this guy is something and has heard that he's the son of David. Who knows if he knows what that means, right, over there in Jericho. But he uses it as his calling as his card to summon Jesus's attention. Right? When we get to Jerusalem, um, Son of David is going to be a part of the coming kingdom of our ancestor David in the in the very next scene after this. Right? He Bartimaeus is going to call him Son of David, and when we get to the Palm Sunday scene. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David is going to be the language people use when they when they acclaim Jesus. So it starts the theme of Son of David stuff. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. I mean, good, good. Th there was a faith healing tradition, right, in this time period. And I just wonder how many of the people who are healed then go the extra step that the person who performed the healing actually may have some relationship with God. Yeah, yeah, and, and it, it's interesting because the disciples, dis, the disciples enforcement of a no, of a no exercising in Jesus name code, right, in the, in the passage uh, after the boys healed, um, is kind of maybe trying to forfend against somebody being associated with God through doing this and getting the credit. Acts has a scene where somebody tries to hijack uh, hijack power, right? Simon Magus. Um, mm -hmm. So so I think you're onto something, Reggie, about you know, what assumptions or conclusions do we draw when somebody does something wondrous? Um, anything from, well, that was cool, all the way up to, well, that person must have God status. And we get that in the, in the in the Gospels and in the early Christian milieu. Other questions or comments or anything you want to talk about? It's good to see you all. Mm -hmm. Bob, you have a question? Uh, I, actually, I actually had a comment. I had a friend who worked at World Vision who came upon two of the employees arguing about who was the more humble. <laughs> That's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's better than James and John, but it doesn't quite get it, does it? <laughs> uh, Joe, did I see your hand too? Oh, yeah. 
So, Alan, as, as we've said before, I tried to empty my head of all the sermons from all the decades. And as I was reading about the epileptic, um, that happened to me once on the school bus in high school coming home. One of my friends heeled over into my lap and he was foaming and rigid and, and thrashing and you try to keep him from banging his head. And it was like three and a half miles to my house from school. So uh, another friend and I got off with him at his stop. We almost had to carry him off. And there was a few other kids that got off at that stop. And they went to his house and found a neighbor lady. And we just sat with him on the lawn. And by the time he came, he could kind of stumble. And we got him home. It was a couple more miles. So George and I walked home. And see, Jesus, you know, what does it mean to be a disciple? Jesus just cures people. And his disciples generally just cure people. Yeah, yeah. And we did what we could. And we stayed together. So probably that's that's discipleship is you you stay with people and you do what you can yeah yeah and i think that's a that's a good example of what do i do now if i don't seem to have the the gift of casting a demon out of this guy or helping his uh his physical condition what do i do right um i do think as we talked about last week about the miracles or was it two weeks ago um you know i mentioned austin fair and uh he was asked in a very heady Oxford circle, um, do you believe in, in the miracles really having happened? And he said, I don't know. I'm, I can't prove that they did, but I know that God is the only one who can write with history. And, and just a reminder in this setting that as Joe's saying, you do what you can do. It may be that the concept of what can happen in Western uh, thought is limited, right? That's not to say you and your buddy on the bus ought to have suddenly believed you could cast out demons, because if you had, you probably wouldn't have been as helpful to them, right? But it's just to, just to put a reminder in that I think it's worth looking at non-Western cultures and seeing uh, not just reports of, but on the ground, uh, on the ground witnessing of things that we might call impossible, right? So. Um, Anyway, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Another, your... another thought, Alan. The, my buddy was Greek Orthodox. Yeah, go ahead. And their their church put on the best dinners. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> um, others, anything else you'd like to delve into, or any reports from life? Anything that? Yeah, Roy. Thank you, Alan. Um... This was just so fascinating. And I'm going to say something awkwardly. Um, it's, uh, and I think it might be the distinction between what Jesus said and how Mark arranged it. But one of the questions that came, came up to me was how, how does Alan discern these things? Because to me, they are very not obvious. Um, and it's almost like the secret message of Mark, um, which it, it's completely fascinating and obviously from your depth of study, but it scares me a little bit like that. Here's something for you, Roy. And I've said, I've spoken a couple times, the little chant that I have where the experts disagree, we foolish ones are free, right? And, and I think I was in a Bible study um, I was in a Bible study in high school in which it was hosted and run by a sort of matronly pastor's wife called uh, Evelyn Racer, who didn't, hadn't studied in seminary, hadn't done any sort of additional study to just being a Christian through her life. And she would throw out these questions and she would answer ours. And I'm sure when she would throw them out, we would answer wrongly two thirds of the time. But the, it was the best Bible study I've ever been a part of because it, it made us fall in love with the text, right? So when I am saying something looks like this to me, the last thing in the world that I want to do is have you think, oh man, I couldn't do that. I'm going to stop reading, right? The first thing I want you to do is say, well, I see it this other way, right? Or I'm completely baffled by it and I frankly don't believe what you said. 
then we can get into a conversation that moves us toward the text, right? So, uh, you know, I always get the question, what is the best translation to have, right? People always want to know, okay, I'm going to read the Bible now. What is the best translation to have? And my answer is always the same. The one that makes you read more, right? Anything that moves us toward this text, I am convinced opens us to a blessing from God that we wouldn't have if we hadn't moved toward it, right? When I teach, I'm not trying to tell you, uh, um, and God and I meet every week, and we had, our little, um, we had our little focus time, and here's what Mark means. I'm rather saying, this is, how, this is the light I have. If it helps you, great. If not, let's talk about it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, if it seems anything other than a humble guy who's trying to figure this out and has some friends to talk with about it, then it, it's I'm communicating wrongly. <laughs> that makes sense, Roy? Yeah, it does. And I'm sorry if I if I haven't seemed that way. No, Bob, you have you have seemed that way. It was my interpreting, and oh, uh, I was I just it, kept thinking how do, how would, how does he do that? Yeah. Well, I have read it in different ways than you have over time, and I might have some things that I know that you don't know about what Josephus wrote or about what Qumran people believe, but that doesn't mean the interpretation I offer is either the final word or thought by me to be anything like the final word, yeah. right? Um, yes. It just means this is what I got. This is how I might be able to help you see if it helps, and if it moves you toward the text, I'm really happy. Beautiful. Thank you. Bob, I saw your hand up again. I, yes, talking about translation, anything, any significant difference between lose your life and lose your soul? Yeah, it's interesting. The, the New Revised Standard Version does life from suke. It's the Greek is suke. And most translations do soul, right? And I have, I have some friends who are actually on the translation committee for the New Revised Standard Version. But I never got to ask them about that. Um, I have a feeling that it was an attempt to speak to a 21st century mind where soul gets less print than life does, right? So they're trying to translate in a way that people will more likely understand. Uh, what's his soul business? Uh, um, but, but I'm not sure, right? We don't talk as much about soul than other ages have, as other, other ages have, but I'm not sure why they went with that. I'm good with soul as a translation of that. If I were translating it, that's what I'd use. Um, others, these, these are great questions, great reflections. Well, you're great. Thank you. Thank you for, for coming and for staying and for reading Mark, which is the goal here, right? Uh, next week, we get into that Holy Week. So I wish you good reading. Read 11, 12, 13 if you get time. Um, your prep guide will come out tomorrow, so you can add that afterward. But I always hope you'll read first and then read my stuff as sort of how, how can this help me a little bit. Um, but whatever you do, get ready for sacred, sacred space because we get into Jerusalem next week and, and that week we spend between Palm Sunday and Easter. So. That's where we'll be for three straight weeks. Um, so God bless you this week, and we'll be in the Holy Week next week. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. God bless. Good night. Good night from Kamloops. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
That's great. It seems like they're really going after it. Yeah, I love it. That's great. Okay. Good night, Roy. Good night now. Good night, Bill. Good night, Lisa. Diane Rublin, good to see your name. Good night, one and all. I'm going to go ahead and close the room now. So I will see you next time.